So historical geology students, um, this is the first video for this week and it's going to be called Spring 8. And um, next week we're going to have a our first test. So let me see here. Um, our first test is going to be on February the 8th, Monday, at 7 p.m. It's going to be one hour long, and it will be 50 multiple choice questions. It's open book, so you can use your notes. Make sure that you watch all the lecture videos, take good notes. There will be a few questions from the lab on the, on the test, but most of it is going to be from the lecture videos. About 90% of it will be from lecture videos and maybe just be a few questions from the um, labs. So we left off last time talking about um, there being, um, we talked about minerals. Uh, we talked about minerals being the building blocks of rocks. In other words, rocks are made up of combinations of different minerals. We also divided the minerals between the silicates and the non-silicate minerals. Now, this particular image from the PowerPoint here, and this is from your book, shows you some common silicate minerals. This particular mineral is called olivine, then augite, hornblende, and biotite. These four minerals here are quartz, orthoclase, which is also called potassium feldspar, by the way, plagioclase feldspar, and muscovite. Why did they divide the minerals into these two sets of four? Well, the four minerals on your four silicate minerals on your left are referred to as mafic minerals. M A F I C. Mafic minerals. The four minerals on the right are called felsic minerals. F E L S I C. The difference between mafic minerals and felsic minerals is quite simple. The mafic minerals are darker in color, and the felsic minerals are lighter in color. One somewhat something um, uh, somewhat unusual aspect of, uh, when we're looking at silicate minerals in terms of color is. We consider green to be the darkest color. Green is darker than black. So remember that even a light green like this is considered to be the darkest mineral. So if a if a mineral is green in color, we consider it to be ultra mafic or ultra dark. Basically, these are your four mafic minerals and these are your four felsic minerals. Your mafic minerals, their dark color is a result of them being richer in iron and magnesium. So your mafic minerals are iron magnesium rich. Your felsic minerals are iron magnesium poor. Also, the felsic minerals tend to have more silica in them. More silica. And why is that important? The reason why that's important, you need to know this, because if you look at a darker colored rock, a rock that contains these darker colored mafic minerals, it's going to be iron magnesium rich. And iron and magnesium are heavier. They have a high specific gravity. What does that mean? Specific gravity. Specific gravity is a measure of how heavy something is with respect to water. 
So if a substance has a, a specific gravity of 2, um, it's going to be 2 times as heavy as water. For the, so if you took um, an object that have, had a specific gravity of 2, and it was a cube of a certain size, it would be twice as heavy as a cube of water that, so water that size. Bottom line is, your mafic rocks that contain mafic minerals are heavy for their size. Remember that. Because if you understand that, you're going to understand how, why, how play tectonics works. And that's the next chapter we're talking about. For now, just remember that the oceanic crust is mafic, whereas the continental crust is felsic. The oceanic crust is heavier for its size than the continental crust. And if you keep, if you bear that in mind, the plate tectonics will be a lot easier to understand. Some minerals, like this mineral here, galena, G-A-L-E-N-A, -E or this mineral here, calcite, C-A-C-L-I-T-E, are not silicate minerals. You can tell by the chemical, chemical formula. Galena is lead sulfide. Calcite is calcium carbonate. There's no silica in, in that chemical formula. So, fair warning, on the test there will be a few questions and some chemical formula will be shown and you'll have to figure out are they um, silicate or non-silicate minerals. In physical geology we talked about there being three major rock types and we've also talked about it here in historical geology but if you're really interested in rocks then um, physical geology would be your cup of tea and you could take that class this summer um, this summer we're gonna have a, a physical geology class online and since you took historical geology you have you'll have an advantage you'll know some of the material and feel free to sign up for that if you're interested in physical geology this summer I've always said that the key to getting out of college faster is to take summer classes So there's three types of rocks, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. Igneous rocks, once again, are rocks that form from magma or lava from melting. The rock was at one time liquid at very high temperatures, between 700 and 13 degrees, 1300 degrees Celsius, and they cooled to form an igneous rock. Igneous means born of fire. We're going to take a look at some common igneous rocks in this chapter. Sedimentary rocks are the rocks we're going to focus on in, in historical geology. And these are rocks that form on the surface of the earth. They're deposited. Sediments are deposited on the surface of the earth in every single surface environment you might think of. They can form in rivers, in lakes, in the shallow ocean, on a delta, in the deep ocean, um, in deserts, by glacial ice, on beaches, tidal flats, and uh, swamps, and the places where sedimentary rocks form, uh, where the deposition occurs, are called depositional environments. When you pick up, picked up one of those sedimentary rocks in lab, you should have figured out the depositional environment of that rock or a possible depositional environment. For example, quartz sandstone could form on a beach, on a desert, in a river, on a delta, many environments. You, you only needed to list, it, list one to get that correct on the, in lab. Deeper in the earth, pressures and temperatures are higher. And when those pressures and temperatures, when the pressures and temperatures are high enough, they can cause those metamorphic rocks, metamorphic rocks to form. So a metamorphic rock is a rock that's formed due to increased pressure, increased temperature, and or the presence of chemically active fluids. All of the th one, two, or three of those factors could um, 
have resulted in rock to have changed to a metamorphic rock. We'll take a look at some common metamorphic rocks too in this chapter. What's this diagram here? Well, this is a, a diagram straight out of your textbook. And it depicts something that geologists refer to as the rock cycle. If you can understand the rock cycle, and I know you can, you, you'll understand a lot about how the earth works and how different types of rocks form, how different, including igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rocks. Note all the arrows here. And what these arrows show is that igneous rocks, for example, can become sedimentary rocks. And those sedimentary rocks can become metamorphic rocks. And the metamorphic rocks can become igneous rocks again. That's what happens when you follow this circle. However, igneous rocks can directly form metamorphic rocks. That's what this green arrow shows. Or in, um, that can occur as well. When we're talking about igneous rocks, there are two types of igneous rocks. And so I want the igneous rocks can be plutonic or volcanic. But the author of your textbook uses the British terms. He was probably trained in the UK. And he uses intrusive and extrusive. So these terms are used interchangeably. They mean the same thing. We're going to use the, ro the terms that are mostly used in the United States and Canada, plutonic and volcanic. What's the difference between a plutonic, that's an intrusive rock, and a extrusive or a volcanic igneous rock? Well, if rock melts deep underneath the earth and crystallizes before it could reach the surface of the earth, we call it a plutonic igneous rock. So plutonic igneous rock forms deep in the earth as magma cools and crystallizes. However, if that magma reaches the surface of the earth and erupts to form a volcano, then that molten rock is called lava. Lava is simply magma that's reached the surface of the earth. When lava cools in a volcano, it's going to make a volcanic igneous rock. Okay, so let's follow the path here of um, see how rock is formed and how it changes from one type to the next. And if you can do that by yourself, you will understand the rock cycle. As we've mentioned before, the deeper you go in the earth, the higher the temperatures are. So deep in the earth, that's where magma forms. That's what this reddish coloration in this diagram is showing you. Magma, or molten rock being formed. This magma is going to be hot and buoyant. It's going to rise because it's less dense than the solid rock around it. Some of it will cool and crystallize to form intrusive igneous rocks or plutonic igneous rocks. Others will rise to the surface to form volcanic rocks, which are also igneous. Now, these volcanoes, for example, um, consist of volcanic igneous rock, and then it rains uh, on the surface of the earth. We know it rains. And um, that can break apart that mountain one tiny piece at a time and break it down to the size of little s sand grains through a process called weathering. So weathering is the process by which you break solid rock into tiny particles of either gravel, sand, silt, or clay. And this gravel, sand, silt, or clay is formed by weathering. Then this sediment can be moved by water, wind, or ice. But let's just say, um, we'll just say water for, uh, to make it simpler. It rains on top of this mountain. It breaks this volcanic rock into sand-sized particles. 
and the river transports the sediment downstream. Where do most rivers end up? In the ocean, right? So these sand grains are going to be transported great distances, maybe for hundreds or thousands of miles until they reach the shoreline and then the sediment is deposited onto the beach. So first the rock was weathered, then it was transported by the river, then it was deposited into layers on the coastline, forming the layers of sand on a beach. That process where the sand is deposited uh, is called deposition. Imagine that these layers now are laid down along the coastline. One layer, and then another layer on top of that, and another layer on top of that. Instead of saying layers, though, for now on, we're going to say beds. So you have a, a bed of sand deposited, another bed of sand deposited on top of it, another bed of sand deposited on it, and another one like that. So that the layers on the bottom are always the older layers, and the younger layers are on the top. Right? What's going to happen to these sand, older sand layers uh, as they get pushed on by the overlying layers? They're going to get compacted or pushed together. That's called compaction. They're going to be pressed together. Also, they'll be underneath the groundwater table, and water will percolate between the sand grains and cement together those sand grains. So through compaction and cementation, those beds of sand will become quartz sandstone. Can you picture that? Try and do this yourself. Uh, turn the video off later on and try and see if you can do this yourself. And then, as the sand this sandstone is formed deep underground, eventually they're going to be buried so deep by younger and younger layers that they're going to be deep, deep enough in the earth that they'll be exposed to higher pressures, higher temperatures, and chemically active fluids. And they will metamorphose and change into metamorphic rocks. Eventually, these, as more young layers are bury, um, bury these even deeper in the earth, the temperatures will be so high that these metamorphic rocks can melt, making new magma. So that you can see how this cycle can go on over and over and over again. So what, was a, what is a sedimentary rock may have been an igneous or metamorphic rock in the past. What, what is a metamorphic rock may have been an igneous or sedimentary rock in the past. What is driving this rock cycle? Well, it's quite simple. Earth's internal heat engine. The heat within the Earth drives this rock cycle. And the heat in the Earth comes from radioactive isotope decay. Let's first talk a bit about igneous rocks. We already mentioned the fact that when magma cools underground, we have plutonic igneous rocks. And when lava cools on the surface of the earth, we make volcanic igneous rocks. First thing I'd like to mention is that plutonic igneous rocks cooled slowly under the magma cooled slowly underneath the earth's surface so that large crystals can grow whereas lava erupts onto the surface of the earth since it's exposed to the cold air at the surface of the earth the crystals will grow quite quickly and the crystals are going to be smaller another way of saying it is that plutonic rocks have big crystals that are visible to the naked eye, whereas volcanic rocks have small crystals that are not visible to the naked eye. So what we like to say is that plutonic igneous rocks have a phaneritic texture, and volcanic igneous rocks have a aphanitic texture. Phanaritic means big crystals, aphanitic means small crystals. And before I move onwards, I'll just show you that uh, what they look like. A 
phanaritic texture means that the crystals are big such as in um, all of these igneous rocks here's an igneous rock see how big the crystals are in this igneous rock that's a plutonic rock now let's take a look at a affinitic texture this is an igneous rock called basalt b-a-s-a-l-t b-a-s-a-l-t notice how small the crystals are you can see them underneath the magnifying glass but the individual crystals are not visible in the uh, in, with the naked eye now if you've really been paying attention you can answer this question this rock which is called basalt that's what the oceanic crust is made of is it iron magnesium rich or iron magnesium poor does it have mafic minerals in it or felsic minerals well you should see, the correct answer is it's mafic it's black right so it's mafic and is it does it have iron, a lot of iron and magnesium in it yes that's what gives it its black color did it cool on the surface of the earth yes it's volcanic and has small crystals let's go back to this diagram when magma cools underneath the surface of the earth to make plutonic igneous rocks you can form five main types of structures we have so five five kinds of igneous intrusions also called plutons we have dikes sills lacoliths batholiths and stocks okay so there are five types of igneous plutons dikes sills lacoliths batholiths and stocks in order to describe igneous plutons we use these two words you've probably never heard of concordant and discordant if an igneous pluton is concordant that means it follows sedimentary layering if it cuts across sedimentary beds it's discordant if it follows sedimentary beds it's concordant now let's take a, a closer look here. The first igneous pluton we'll talk about, and you should be able to recognize this if it's on the test, if you see one, is a dike. Remember, this is a two-dimensional image trying to portray three-dimensional geometries so that this dike is going to come out towards you like a sheet of igneous plutonic rock. Does it cut across these sedimentary beds? Sure it does. See, it cuts across this shale bed and this siltstone bed and this shale bed. It cuts across sedimentary beds. So are dikes concordant or discordant? Dikes are discordant. And they are sheet-like. Because remember, it's coming out of, the pay, out of the computer screen towards you. This is a sheet-like igneous pluton that is discordant and we call it a dike. An igneous pluton that is sheet-like because it's coming out at you from the computer screen. Imagine it coming out from the computer screen. It's a sheet-like igneous pluton. But is it concordant or discordant? It's concordant because it follows the sedimentary beds. So a sheet-like igneous pluton that is concordant is called a sill. S-I-L-L. -L. Next type of igneous pluton we're going to talk about is called a lacolith. That's what this mushroom-shaped igneous pluton is. It's a lacolith. Does it cut across the sedimentary beds? Here's a shale bed and here's a limestone bed. Does it cut across them? No, it pushes up this limestone bed, but it doesn't cut it. It doesn't cut through it. So a lacolith is a concordant igneous pluton that is mushroom shaped it's called a lacolith 
So far, we've talked about two types of concord igneous plutons, laccoliths and sills, and only one type of discordant igneous pluton called a dike. Fourth type of igneous pluton is called a stock, and you can see that this shape is irregular. It has no regular shape, but it does cut across sedimentary beds. So a stock is an irregular shaped igneous pluton that cuts across sedimentary beds. It's discordant. This whole entire thing down here, except for the stock, all this is a batholith. So batholith is an enormous discordant igneous pluton. Batholiths can cover distances from hundreds or thousands of miles. Five types of igneous plutons, batholith, lacolith, dike, sill, lacolith. Let's for, so if on the test there's a picture of a dike, you should know that this is a igneous dike, not a river dike. So just, okay, so here's look at this mafic dike right here. See this mafic dike? It's dark in color, cutting across these lighter colored rocks. That's a dike. Now let's take a look at a sill. Here's a sill. This is a mafic sill that cuts across, that it does not cut across the sedimentary layers, but follows the sedimentary layers. It's mafic, and it's probably basalt, and it's cutting across, I mean, and it's not cutting across the layers, so it is concordant. This is a sill, S-I-L-L. -L. Here's an igneous um, lacolith, a mushroom-shaped igneous pluton that it used to be underground, but the rocks over it were eroded away, and now it's exposed, and you can see it's mushroom-like shape, a lacolith. So, we already talked about what felsic means, light in color. It's a silica-rich rock, iron and magnesium poor. A mafic rock is um, darker in color, and it's found in the oceanic crust. Phanaritic means it's got big crystals and it cooled slow underground. Aphanitic means it's got small crystals in it and it cooled fast above the surface of the earth. Now let's take a look. Let's see if you've learned uh, some of this stuff. We're going to take a look at igneous texture and we're going to take a look at igneous color, mafic and felsic. Let's see if I can get a picture here that will work, a basic picture. I said mafic, felsic, intermediate, and then we're going to have our textures, aphanitic and phanaritic. Okay, remember pink is the lightest color, right? Don't forget that, and green is the darkest color. Okay, here you have six ig common igneous rocks. Going, um, so you got color here, felsic, intermediate, or mafic, and then you got phanaritic or, or aphanitic. And so, if all you need to know, ladies and gentlemen, is how dark is the rock and how big the crystals are, and you can name a lot of the igneous rocks, such as these six. If a rock is light in color and has big crystals, it's phanaritic. It's a, called granite, G-R-A-N-I-T-E. If it's light in color, and this is light because it's pink, and the crystals are small, we call it rhyolite, R-H-Y-O-L-I-T-E. If it's dark in color, 
and it has big crystals in it. It's, it's, it's phanaretic. We call it a gabbro, G-A-B-B-R-O. If it's mafic and it's aphanetic, we get basalt. Basalt is has small crystals, it's aphanitic, it's dark in color, it's mafic. Just as in life, not everything is black and white. There's in between. So we have intermediate rocks. Intermediate rocks are not light or dark, such as diorite and andesite. Diorite, as you can see here, has half dark minerals and half light minerals. So you call it intermediate in color or composition. And it's fa if it's phaneritic, it has big crystals in it, we call it diorite. On the other hand, if the crystals are too small to see with the naked eye, and the color is not dark or light, like this is a medium gray, we call it andesite, A-N-D-E-S-I-T-E. -E. Understand this diagram, and you'll get a, a few questions right on the test. Let me ask you a question first. Which of these of these six igneous rocks, which three are phaneritic? I mean, which which of the three are plutonic? I'll give you a few seconds to think about that. Which of these six igneous rock types are plutonic? You should know that the three plutonic igneous rocks are granite, diorite, and gabbro. Because all plutonic rocks are phaneritic. All plutonic rocks have big crystals visible to the naked eye. Which of these six igneous rocks are volcanic? Basalt, andesite, rhyolite are volcanic because they are aphanitic. They have small crystals in them. The oceanic crust is made of mafic rocks. Would they be made of these six igneous rocks? Which two do you th would you find in the oceanic crust? You'd find basalt and gabbro, right? The oceanic crust is made of basalt on the surface. Underneath that is gabbro. The continental crust is made of felsic and intermediate rocks. So you'd find rhyolite and andesite on the surface. And underground, you'd find diorite and granite. So this chart kind of summarizes it. If you know, if you if you know that you look at the, if you pick up an igneous rock, first thing you look at is figure out how big are the crystals. If the crystals are big, you have a phaneritic texture. If the crystals are small, it has an aphanitic texture. The four igneous rocks that are phaneritic are granite, diorite, gabbro, and peridotite. The four igneous rocks that are aphanitic are rhyolite, andesite, basalt, and comatite. As you go from left to right, you go to more mafic rocks. And the specific gravity increases. In other words, they're heavy for their size. And they're darker in color. And they're iron and magnesium rich. As you go towards the left of this diagram, the amount of silica increases. And they're lighter in weight. And lighter in color as well. Here, for each of these igneous rocks, you can also see what minerals are in the rocks. Peridotite would contain um, plagioclase feldspars, pyroxene, and olivine. Whereas a granite would contain quartz, potassium feldspars, sodium-rich plagioclase, biotite, and hornblende. A gabbro would contain calcium-rich plagioclase, hornblende, pyroxene, and olivine. But for this class, just you should know what mafic and felsic is, what aphanitic and phaneritic is, what plutonic and volcanic is. Let's take one last look at this so you know it for the test. Six igneous rocks are the two on the right, mafic or felsic. They're mafic. The two on the left are felsic. The two in the middle are intermediate. Which rocks are plutonic. The three on the bottom or the three on the top? The three on the bottom are plutonic. They have phaneritic textures. They have big crystals. The three on the bottom, the top, are volcanic. They're aphanitic. They're formed by volcanic eruptions. These three on the bottom are found 
and igneous plutons, dike sills, lacoliths, stocks, and batholiths, big crystals. Here you can see some other types of igneous rock that are not, these aren't phaneritic or aphanitic. They have little air bubbles in them. Uh, this one's called scoria, S-C-O-R-I-A. This one's called pumice, P-U-M-I-C-E. When you find air bubbles in igneous rocks, that means they're made of glass. They have no minerals in them. And glass can only form from volcanic eruptions. Because in order to form glass, the lava has to be cooled immediately. And that can only happen on the surface of the earth. Okay, that's enough for now. Next time, we'll talk a little bit about sedimentary rocks and metamorphic rocks.